Welcome to this evening's discussion of protests, post-digital activism and the archive, hashtag Minz, hashtag Voso, hashtag Cairo. Um, this event is part of the Via Duinicum, uh, the summer school organized by the Europa University Via Duina at Frankfurt Oder and uh, ZOIS, um, the Center for East European and International Studies and the European New School of Digital Studies at the Europa University Viadrina are co-hosts of this summer school. But we're ha very happy to, to have this uh, more public event on a theme which uh, speaks to uh, the basic ideas of this year's summer school. It is in fact a trans-sectoral digital lab. It's a summer school that um, uh, represents a group of um, scholars, um, activists, artists, who spend two weeks together uh, researching, um, developing um, their own artistic projects. And uh, it's all um, done in a, in a format of, of various workshops. But as I said, this is one of several public events. My name is Gwendolyn Sasse. I'm the um, director of the Center for East European and International Studies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome three fantastic speakers for the discussion this evening. And I present them in the order they will be talking initially, and then we'll have a discussion among ourselves and, of course, have um, your comments and questions. You can already start putting them into the chat um, and we'll, we'll come back to them uh, in due course. I'm very happy to be joined by Alexander Herasimenka. He's a postdoctoral researcher at Oxford University at the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, where he belongs to or is part of the program on democracy and technology. He has a degree in political science and computer science, and he's also worked as a journalist and as a media coordinator of an NGO. So I think you combine all kinds of different perspectives we need tonight for this discussion. Um, Alexander got his PhD at the University of Westminster and he worked on uh, digitally enabled political mobilization, in particular in Belarus and Russia. But he's now working more generally on the question, how do political groups and governments use, for example, algorithms, automation, and technology more generally to influence public opinion? And in recent months, I think we have also seen you and heard from you about the mass mobilization in Belarus, and I think you are um, one of few scholars presenting a very nuanced analysis of the uh, use of social media in this um, and different technological tools in this mobilization. So we'll hear more about this in a moment. I will introduce um, Anna Nacher from Yagi Union University and Lara Baladi, uh, a photographer currently based in, in Cairo, um, as we go along. But Alexander, the floor is you, yours. All right, thanks. Thanks a lot. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the event. Um, I think uh, process is something that's been always fascinating and attracting a lot of attention, especially when they're happening, especially when they're live on TV screens, when it's big, huge mobilizations that happen all across uh, the city, town, the country. And uh, just uh, last year, there was very big mobilization maybe uh, many of you noticed a uh, huge protest movement emerged in belarus and uh, as as in many cases before that protest movement that involved maybe up to 10 percent of every adult in belarus so it's huge huge in terms of numbers uh, almost every city town been covered people have been asking why what happened why this country where it seems it seemed nothing been happening over the last 20, 25, 30 years, suddenly erupted in a huge rebellion. What, what was the reason? What are the consequences? What uh, were the demands of the protest movement to have democratic elections to essentially um, change the political system? Whether those demands be satisfied? Many questions people have been asking. And actually, those questions are often, uh, they are not unique, as well as was what was not unique that time, obviously, is, of course, the attention to the use of technologies. So like previous years, many, uh, many people would um, highlight the use of social media during protests, uh, Twitter, Facebook. 
these days, people have highlighted another technology called Telegram, this messaging platform that's been actively used by many activists. As you see, technology has always been uh, also fascinating people who've been discussing protest movements. Uh, all types of technologies, I think radio, television, uh, activists of 60s or 80s would really love to get at least 30 seconds on TV screens because it was the best way to access mass audiences, right? So technology has been always around. They've been changing, been evolving. And I think in case of Belarus, uh, there was another technology that was demonstrated as important sort of tool to mo for mobilization, but it's definitely not the decisive tool. I think it's also important to remember that technologies are not always they, they help to change the dynamics sometimes. They use, they, they use helps to uh, sort of um, bring new dynamics into organizing uh, of protest movement. Uh, leadership, uh, nature of leadership been changing, new innovative ways of sort of leading uh, a protest movement emerge, as well as new ways of, uh, of telling protest uh, movement story also emerge through advanced use of uh, digital affordances. And not least because uh, many of people who join protest movements are often young people, so they love exploring new technologies, with, which often makes them successful. But those three things I mentioned, uh, new ways or uh, new approaches to organizing, to leadership and to storytelling or using uh, affordances to disseminate messages, uh, all those ways they, they change a bit, but unfortunately, very often, they are not uh, most uh, decisive in uh, defining whether a movement is going to be successful or not, right? So what happens, unfortunately, is very often people rely on technologies and they hope that, yes, they're going to they're gonna bring difference this time. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it often doesn't happen. And it didn't happen in Belarus. You remember that uh, the state of protest in Belarus uh, is the following uh, last mo la big huge mobilizations ended by Christmas last year, and many ways of repressions followed. Right, more than forty thousand people, forty thousand, been uh, repressed, detained. Some of them tortured. Some of them are in prison. Thousands of people, great activists, are in prison now in Belarus. Many people, thousands of people had to escape, became political refugees in neighboring countries. So the movement, in a sense, lost. And it wasn't really uh, the last law failure and not the first, obviously, because in the region, in our region of Central Eastern Europe, I think in order to understand what's not been changing, uh, we, we should look around the region. And we understand that, in fact, uh, while technology has been evolving, grievances, emotions that often bring people to protest to the streets haven't evolved that much. They haven't changed that much, in fact, over years. They're very similar emotions that often trigger protests. And that helps to answer this question, why, why, why protest happens. Another way to understand the protest, I think, in our region is to look around uh, and look back a bit. Um, What's been happening in the past, the struggle that's been happening all over the last uh, 60 years, in Ukraine 2014, in Moldova, this bit forgotten revolution 2009, you remember, some many people called it like first Twitter revolution, right? Then in Baltic states in the 90s, in, in, in Poland solidarity movement of 80s, 1968 in Czech Republic, Budapest 56, uh, Berlin, the first, perhaps authoritarian uprising post Second World War. Uh, all of that, all of those events, been triggered by similar grievances, similar emotions, um, though happening in different contexts. But one important element of that context remained uh, important: the dominance of over political systems of these countries. There was political system being affected by the external actors. First of all, by Russia or Soviet Union or Russian Empire, whatever you call it, it's always been around. And most of the days it played this kind of negative role uh, in political science sometime, uh, this role called Black Knights. So sort of those actors who propel and um, propel authoritarianism 
and prevent democratic changes. Uh, and that's what I think had, hasn't changed over years. So technology has changed, emotions didn't change, but also in our region, the role of Russia in uh, resisting authoritarian uh, or supporting authoritarian uh, regimes and resisting pro-democratic changes uh, hasn't changed much. And I think uh, that might explain, unfortunately, um, uh, the, the, the failure of pro-democracy movement in Belarus. Good news is that uh, in our region, across our region, those events that I mentioned, half of them were successful, but eventually all, all countries that rebelled eventually uh, will manage to start democratic changes and somehow launch uh, democratic transformations. Perhaps it might be also the future uh, of, of, of Belarus. That's, that's, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce my, my uh, initial thoughts. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, and I thought it was interesting that you highlighted immediately what are similarities or continuities rather than sort of the differences or assumed differences with the use of or very visible use of digital technologies. Um, but I was wondering if you, if I could ask a question right away, um, I mean, is there nevertheless something in the way in which um, the protests were organized on, and, and digital technology would be one element of it uh, that accounts for sort of where we've got to. I mean, I don't want to say the final outcome. I think it's still going on and, and there will have to be some, some movement at some point again. But um, nevertheless, do you think where we got to has something to do with how um, digital technology was used? Obviously, obviously, I think, uh, as I mentioned, technologies, uh, their use affect how, how movements emerge and how they get organized, what type of leadership emerges. And I think indeed it, the movement might, it's, it's still progressing in some way, as in the way that solidarity movement remained around even besides uh, total, total crackdown on it in Poland in the 80s and sort of pro-democracy dissident movement existed uh, all, all, all the years in, in Czech Republic and in other cases as well, they mentioned. So in, in this way, movements still, still exist, but in terms of mass mobilizations, we don't have it, they don't really happen. And in terms of consequences, I think, um, I think uh, what was one of the major sort of consequences, of course, uh, these changes that uh, use of technologies brought into opportunities for people to, to overcome the total fragmentation of the society and get together and discuss politics finally. So they help to politicize society. And as technologists, as, a, as providers of public space remained, remained around, people keep using them uh, to sort of, um, to keep uh, discussing politics. And for that reason, uh, remain politicized and remain being interested in the events that triggered, that triggered uh, the movement. So in uh, one of the current uh, ways is, is the supportive role of this sort of, uh, of the fire that was never totally over. Uh, it's still around, but it's, it's, uh, the, its flames are barely visible. And technologists uh, is, is exactly this oxygen that helped to support the fire. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll come back to, to some of these issues uh, later on. Let's move uh, to hashtag Warsaw and to Anna Nacher. She's an associate professor at the Union University in Krakow. Uh, her research interests include um, big themes, digital culture, cultural theory, media art, sound studies, and e-literature. And for example, in a recent, recent international uh, collaborative project, she's uh, looked at the link between electronic literature and digital art and the, the COVID um, pandemic. But I think today you're also, I should say, a sound artist um, yourself. So you also bring different, different perspectives to the discussion. And I think um, you will focus um, tonight on, on an example of online, offline feminist activism in, in Poland. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Gwen, for uh, introducing me. Th thank you, Alexander, for, for your... Um, um, uh, for, for, for your introduction in a way to the regional specificity, because of course Poland and Belarus um, 
border each other. So right now we have ongoing discussion about a few issues, including the mass protests in Belarus last year. So uh, so parts of what you said, uh, I will be echoing in my um, uh, very short presentation as well. Um, and of course, in, indeed, uh, today I am going to focus on a feminist protest. And I'll start with a very short video clip that um, you can also um, see for yourself. And the link is provided in the chat, I believe. And um, this short video clip will present the very special moments, uh, namely October last year, when, when the uh, one of the biggest mass protests broke, and the protests that actually exceeded um, uh, solidarity movement uh, when it comes to, to, to sheer numbers of participants. So, um, so let me now share my screen, and I hope you can see it. <laughs> I'm here because I think these are my fundamental rights to decide if I want to give birth to a child or not. PIS is taking away our civil rights. The worst part of it is that in case of unwanted pregnancy, we can deal with this somehow because we have means, we have support, we have family here in Warsaw. But it's about girls in smaller villages who can even lose their lives. <laughs> Today, Poland is an example for Europe. It's an example for the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not stuck in the historical necessity which commands marching to the left and gradually increases the availability to murder people. Of course, that, that was a very short video clip uh, take by, via The Sun, which is not, you know, uh, usually the, the source I would refer to. Uh, but uh, this video clip presented in a very, I think, concise uh, way uh, what was at stake uh, at this protest. Uh, so, um, of course, you could also um, you could also hear um, solidarity being shouted, mostly uh, as uh, in Polish it sounded "Solidarność naszą bronią," which means solidarity is our weapon. So this, you know, solidarity movement still echoes, even if uh, it's been critiqued uh, for, for the last decade or so for many reasons, including it's um, it's uh, basically. I would say male bias when it comes to um, um, activists uh, involved in, in the movement. So um, uh, here we have, um, well, today I would say in my very brief presentation today, I would like to focus on three aspects uh, because of course this, uh, this is a big subject. Um, so I'm going to focus on um, the um, conditions of um, uh, social protest um, under circumstances of of a post-digital constellation or, or post-digital condition by which I understand following, um, for example, David Berry and other um, theoreticians, um, by, by which um, term I understand the situation where the digital um, technologies saturated our everyday life completely. Um, uh, which with the consequence that as um, Rob Kitchen and Martin Dodge um, um, proposed, um, th th there are all grounds to uh, talk about code um, space, which means basically the space which is functionally dependent on the code and algorithms, which in um, um, which um, actually leads to yet another uh, consequence. Uh, I would like to propose that um, that uh, this framework that still um, makes us to think about protests um, um, as um, 
two distinct spheres. One is lived reality, uh, so-called real protests, and another is digital activism, often uh, described as superficial and not really effective. And of course, uh, this is this all was uh, in 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 a way um, related to um, so-called Twitter revolutions, which have been. Um, um, would have been analyzed by um, many social scientists and, and, and theoreticians and um, who, who in the, the first phase were very enthusiastic about those digital protests uh, that well um, um, mediated and, and that spread mostly through Twitter, Facebook and, and social uh, media platforms. But then the whole wave of the critique um, uh, showed us the different aspect of, of of uh, those movements, uh, emphasizing that um, as far as those uh, protests are happening within the frames of uh, uh, social media um, uh, uh, platforms interested mostly in, in uh, gaining profits, and uh, it is not actually very um, efficient way to run the uh, bigger uh, social movements, which is, of course, a hot topic in itself. So I wanted to touch on this subject to um, to basically uh, to basically argue that this uh, critique of the social media protest um, through this critique, I, I think we shouldn't be um, um, we, we shouldn't uh, um, uh, uh, we should be wary of throwing um, uh, the the child child with the bathwater. So I would propose uh, um, uh, seeing. Uh, uh, contemporary protests more as a continuum between digital and uh, street actions, because this is what actually happened in Poland uh, with um, all women strike. Here it is a scene from a Warsaw street from October 2020, where over 100,000 people gathered in one day. That was the single uh, biggest protest action in Poland uh, that far exceeded what um, had happened back in 1981 when Solidarity Movement was active. Uh, but um, at the same time, what we've seen was um, extremely um, interesting mobilization across um, the social um, strata that in, in the case of Poland, the major uh, division line is between rural areas and small cities and the big towns. So that's why this hashtag should be not Warsaw actually for, for, for on this occasion today, because Warsaw was not even the most important um, site uh, of, of the protest. What was significant, what, what was actually very meaningful was the fact that, um, that uh, many smaller towns and even um, rural areas, the towns of say uh, 2000 inhabitants sometimes hosted um, the really um, uh, powerful protest action. In some places, there were just five or six people protesting. So, and that was massive. Um, uh, in, in terms of the saturation of those protests, here you can see the map that pictures um, all the places where, where the protests were held. And, and in this sense, that was really massive across almost all strata of the society. That, that was actually uh, the one of the icons of, of um, uh, current phase of the protest, because the protests have um, has started in 2016 when uh, this initiative to uh, ban abortion was um, uh, implemented in the parliament um, for, um, for, for the first time. Actually, it wasn't the first time, but one of the very early um, attempts um, um, uh, on banning the abortion, uh, ab abortion completely. And what happened was that this uh, sign or symbol um, quickly became a kind of a um, a kind of a um, sort to 
a dialect, so to speak, so kind of a signal that we're supporting the strike. Uh, to the extent that, uh, for example, my students employed the sign uh, as they um, as they avatars in MS Teams or Zoom, uh, wherever um, the teaching was going on. And uh, over the course of the last couple of months, since October 2020, we've had a few quarrels um, at the university level, whether those uh, signs should be allowed some of uh, some um, academics uh, who are on the conservative side, they actually banned using the symbol altogether uh, uh, as avatar on MS Teams. And what was significant, what was meaningful uh, too, was the kind of a new aesthetics and new sensibilities that I would um, uh, connect to the whole new generation and the whole new culture and the whole new internet culture based on memes mostly, because these are highly intertextual. Tool. For example, here you can see the slogan that says, Anushka has spilled the oil. Um, and of course, it is um, allusion to Master and, um, and Margaret, um, the, the famous novel by Mikhail Bulhakov. Uh, signaling certain, you know, moments in, in the plot that is um, actually um, announcing uh, the, the, um, crew, the, the key point of, of the narrative. Um, for example, here you have another slogan, uh, this kind of outlaw and this kind of a social pathology um, is not to be uh, produced even in seams, which is again, a reference to uh, the popular um, uh, simulation game. Um, um, uh, gain. So, uh, so that example, that was just a few examples, but what I wanted to emphasize is first um, the nature of post-digital protests that happen in between digital and lived reality and the new aesthetics and new sensibilities. And in, in this continuum, what uh, is important is also um, even the tiniest acts performed um, uh, on the internet, such as you know, sharing um, hashtags, such as um, uh, reblogging certain content. Usually those kind of activity is being relegated to um, this, the, the area of um, uh, not so meaningful actions. Often it gets confined with um, uh, algorithmic procedures being performed by machines or um, automated to a high extent. Uh, but what I was watching while uh, while doing my, my research on this um, uh, movement was that, in fact, those tiny acts of uh, everyday um, everyday uh, opposition or, or everyday protest. Um, actually made a difference to the extent that, and that will be my closing remark, to the extent that according to the poll uh, run by Polish Center for Public Opinion Research in March 2016, only 14% 14, 14 of respondents supported abortion because of women's difficult situation. And a couple of months later, the same poll was uh, performed, was run, so in October the same year, this option was supported by 20%. In 2018, uh, the poll was repeated again, and now 46% um, of respondents, respondents agreed with the opinion that abortion should be available. And exactly the same question was asked two weeks ago. And now, uh, uh, Fifty-three percent of respondents um, um, agrees uh, agree with opinion that uh, abortion should be allowed. So, what I want to say, um, wrapping up my uh, presentation, is that the protest, the post-digital protest, as I see it, is a side of uh, uh, polyvocal um, debate. Uh, that actually uh, means mobilizing mobilizing uh, differences, uh, mobilizing diversity. That that's how I would call it. Because regardless of the fact that almost full abortion ban was implemented in Poland, uh, the social um, ac acceptance for uh, the abortion because of the difficult situation um, has actually significantly increased, and uh, within. Uh, less than, I think, less than four years only. 
So that would be my um, uh, last um, remark. Thank you so much for your, for your thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, could you perhaps um, sort of coming coming back to you right away? Um, uh, define for us how you understand post-digital um, and post-digital protest um, and, and with that really also goes the question is do you think um, the case you have mostly talked about now is um, sort of it's a, it's a recent development or should we already going back in time think more generally about these interactions and not these dividing lines beyond because um, because of on and offline um, protests supposedly being something different or has something changed and now we should um, use this term and in Poland it might be this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these, these are excellent questions. Uh, like I said, the post digital for me means actually different weight of framing materiality, uh, because you know, in the in the moment, the cultural moment where digital um, uh, technologies are widely available, of course, it depends on where and to whom, right? That's another subject. But uh, in general, we can say that our everyday reality is saturated with um, data harvesting um, devices, with uh, um, basically data processing pretty much everywhere, uh, mostly via mobile media. So with this comes the situation where the digital is not so much separated from uh, everyday um, uh, uh, lived reality, like I said, including semi uh, including, including so somatic, somatic and bodily um, uh, performances. In other words, you know, all kinds of wearable technologies, technologies that are really uh, efficient in harvesting the data from uh, the urban space and this kind of um, technologies. Um, with this comes also the situation where when um, the younger generations is so much used to uh, relying on the digital that um, to some extent it hampers their ability to be able to significantly intervene in, in those on a technological level. I, I'm, I'm saying this uh, based on the experience with my students who um, are uh, avid um, uh, social media users, but they don't know actually where some crucial um, features are stored on their hard drives, right? So it isn't paired with significant amount of uh, technological literacy, but that's another subject. So in other words, for me, that's why, that's what, um, that's what um, uh, informs um, the, the, the need to sort of um, um, revise this framework that divided digital activism from everyday or you know lived act uh, activism or uh, experiential activism in other words uh, this framework that divided being active on twitter and on the other side being active on the street uh, today is not so much this division is not so much not not so ob obvious anymore which leads to the uh, answer to your um, second question extremely interesting and uh, actually this answer supports what i what i've just said because the fact that in um, one october evening in uh, 2020 by the way during um, the particularly difficult uh, phase of the pandemic covid pandemic in poland where we had um, a very high number of cases and the high number of uh, um, of um, of uh, covid related deaths uh, so the fact that 100,000 people gathered in the streets of Warsaw um, is uh, really uh, is, is strongly uh, related to the fact that um, starting in the early 90s, um, the feminist organizations in Poland um, have been consistently uh, very active. So, um, so this this uh, massive mobilization um, uh, ha has happened on the crossroads of digital activism, uh, consistent feminist uh, activity and activism in Poland, uh, and um, and also um, kind of a new sensibilities emerging with uh, the kind of a vernacular. Uh, cultural productions active, actively shared on social media, such as meme culture, such as TikTok um, performances, etc. So, so that that would be my answer to your questions.
Thank you very much, Anna. Um, and now last but not least, let's, let's turn to Lara Baladi. Um, she's a multimedia artist and an archivist. She will tell us more about that, I think, description in a, in a moment. She was born in Beirut and uh, currently is linked in to us uh, from Cairo. And uh, she is also a member of the Arab Image Foundation, where she uh, curates uh, various magazine editorials, but also artist uh, exhibitions and artist residencies. And um, maybe this will feature in, in your introductory remarks, um, Laura. She's one of the founders of the um, Tahir Radio, the first uh, free online radio that was established during the Egyptian revolution of 2011. And also probably side by side, Tahir Cinema, um, which was the idea to archive what is going on or what was going on during those protests. And um, she is currently um, working on a project linked to an MIT fellowship on a trans, and she's working on a transmedia activism project, Vox Populi. And I think we'll hear a bit more about that. Over to you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Gwen, for having me today. And uh, Anna and Alexander, uh, it was great to hear what you had to say. Um, what I will do is uh, I will actually take the conversation a little bit backwards in time and hopefully to bring it back to everything that Anna and Alexander uh, spoke about earlier. Uh, so I would like to take everyone a little bit backwards, almost 10 years ago, actually a little bit, um, 10 years ago. Um, I get lost with the, you know, with the passing of time that is very intense. So I'm trying to share my, there you go. So let's see if you can uh, view this. Okay, so, um, so 10 years ago in 2011, the, if we all remember the, the protest in Tahrir Square in Egypt took place. And uh, it was a very a significant moment. So I will talk today from the perspective of my artistic practice, uh, knowing that my artistic practice is really embedded in the practice of photography and the use of photography as a way of creating art. So I was really fascinated when the revolution started because there was an extraordinary obvious moment that changed photography and the meaning of photography with the use of uh, here you see a lot of Nokia and non-smartphones, Androids, um, where the, large, uh, the largest number of protesters produce a huge number of photographs and then for most they get uploaded to the internet and then disseminated across the internet globally. And so I was really fascinated as someone using photography in the change of the use of this uh, technology or photography as a digital medium. And I really started my whole interest in the language that emerged. Let me see why it doesn't move, trying to move the slide. Okay, so I was really interested in the, the language, the popular language, the, the kind of vernacular language that came out of this moment um, in Tahrir and how it was creating a kind of new era or really marking the beginning of a new uh, way of thinking uh, and working with images within the context of revolution and protest. And so of course the use of social media here we see, I don't know if you see the whole image um, fully, but it's the page on Facebook that was called We Are All Khalid Said, who was a a young man who was uh, killed by the police, uh, by police brutality, uh, nine months before the, the protest in Tahrir started in 2011, and whose death really created and agitated the younger population, uh, especially, to, uh, um, to demand uh, dignity and to demand a whole uh, different uh, state of things. And so um, here we see how uh, people used this photograph in the protests. And so my interest for uh, the medium of photography and for digital production was um, also marked by the fact that uh, it was 2011 and the only example that I think existed at the time was the example of Iran in 2009, where essentially Twitter was used for demonstrating and for sharing the images of Neda 
the martyr of that revolution and this protest and how that came out of Iran via the Twitter platform. In 2009, this was not yet so much discussed uh, globally as much as it was understood by a lot of people who understand digital media, who really talked about uh, or, or who were concerned with these kind of political ideas. But as a kind of uh, democratized tool, I think it was only a kind of introduction to that possibility and to how social media could be opted to be used for and um, for protest and for democracy and against the, the state apparatus. And so in 2011, I'm taking the example of Tahrir because um, it was, let's say, in scale, the biggest, um, the biggest protest that uh, took place in the Arab world in the series of Arab uprisings that were happening then. And the image of the square, the one I showed at the beginning of the slideshow, uh, was really used constantly, either full screen or in the corner of the screen on TVs, on in the news, uh, to refer to the events in Tahrir and also across Egypt and also across the Arab region. And so these images were constantly uploaded to the internet. So as an artist working with archives already and working with popular language, a lot, depending on the things I was interested in, the language would vary. In this case, the language that I became completely fascinated by was this language that erupted in the revolution. So here I have some samples of what I've collected. And so while I was participating day and night in the protest, I also was downloading from the internet photographs, videos, uh, YouTube clips, uh, news um, video clips, satires, graffiti, and so on. And I myself documented uh, the square on a daily basis. What triggered my interest in collecting was the, oops, um, what did I do? What triggered my interest in collecting was the, uh, the correlation between different things happening in different places in the world. So here's an example of a video that was viral at the very beginning of the 2011 uh, protest in Tahrir, uh, which was called Cairo Tiananmen Like Courage, and Tiananmen Square, which if we remember was one of the most famous uh, film clip photograph from 1989 in Tiananmen Square in China. And the relationship between these images and the, the mirror image of Egypt with Tiananmen really prompted my interest in thinking about the language and the digital fabrication of language that was explaining and influenced and inspired and, re, um, and, and kind of uh, reinventing, regurgitating the, the, the images that were already in our collective memory. I also collected uh, the, the conversations that took place on social media. So people posting uh, film clips like the dictator here was Charlie Chaplin, uh, the song by uh, Nina Simon on revolution or a censored cartoon of Betty Boop being raped by her boss in 1934. So quite intense material that was shared as a way of discussing events and ideas and events that were unfolding on the ground. Much later in 2019, this is an example of how the language of revolution has gone from art, from actual historical moments, um, uh, like the anonymous mask, from uh, 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 his history to popular uh, culture and visual culture, such as cinema, uh, with the V from uh, V Like Vendetta, the film. Then you have the Joker, which then influences uh, in Lebanon here the uh, the masks in uh, uh, in the in the in Martyr Square in Beirut. So just this is just to state one example of many. And with this uh, process. The first project that came out was Tahrir Cinema, uh, in which, during which we uh, used the material as a way of bringing it back offline to talk 
back about our subject today and kind of reprogramming uh, these videos that were downloaded from the internet for most of them to bring it back to the street to most of the people in the square who actually didn't have internet, unlike what the, the media across uh, Europe tended to believe. And so this was a way of discussing directly with the people in the street the meaning and the possibilities that were embedded in these moments that we were living as they were happening, uh, as we were watching the videos and as the revolution was still happening. And so this is the crowd that was between 200 and 500 people gathering uh, uh, with our screen every night. Whatever we showed, we then give on USB sticks and give back to people if they wanted to take it back to their governorates, their village, their house, their areas, their cafes, etc. To then show it to people as a counter um, documentation of what was happening uh, and a counter narrative to the state uh, me mainstream media narrative. So this is an example of my current project, which is about uh, looking at the mass of uh, production that takes place during these protests across uh, social media and the internet. This was one of the projects that showed the timeline of different pages on the internet. And I think this kind of resonates with what Anna was saying, which is that um, it's very important, I think, to also continue the fight that the protest is just one trigger during moment, but then there's an ongoing work that needs to be done. And actually, this is often neglected because that's actually the most important work. Not that what I'm showing you right now is necessarily that, but this is just me using this as an example, tiny example of what we can do even after the protest in the street and how to use the, 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 the elements produced in digital media and bring it back out in different forms for people to continue to research and to to speak and to discuss and to and to collaborate. Uh, some examples of uh, exhibitions that I did with my archive. So very importantly, the archive is a kind of living body. It's not something static. It's something that allows for an ongoing conversation and keeps growing because I keep collecting the things that happened since 2011. So I've never really finished the project. It's constantly ongoing. Um, and so here is more recently a uh, language of revolution project, a kind of ABC primer of revolution, of revolting, which goes back to 1960s, one of the first protests, Stonewall, which was one of the first gender protests in New York and uses the butterfly and the, the fist as a kind of introductory icon for saying, you know, these are very simple image and this is how Instead of propagandist uh, educational tool, school educational tool, maybe this is how we can teach our children how to think about solidarity, protest, and democracy. And then now a little bit more, uh, the things that I'm interested in is now later, 10 years later, is how to bring this archive in conversation with the archive of the legal changes that took place in Egypt in the last 10 years. And work on making available the, um, and I'll stop sharing for a second to continue what I want to say. Um, and so, uh, yes, so the legal archive is the way that uh, the conversation with the legal archive and my Tahrir archive is really today uh, how I feel the, the project is uh, becoming a kind of conversation and a way to bring to a larger number uh, information that until now is still too much uh, uh, concealed and only shared with people who work in legal matters, in social injustice, but do not in judiciary, but actually the language of judiciary is still very um, obscure, I would say, for the most of us who are not working in those fields. And so my interest is to really uh, try and bring that language so that we can all be more aware of our um, of our rights, and I'll and I'll say uh, here uh, uh, Latin to end. I will uh, uh, state a Latin uh, uh, quote: "Nemo sensitu ignorae lege," which means ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, "Nul ne doit uh, ignorer la loi," which means that 
uh, today, um, uh, the way that the protest and the digital uh, fabrication of language, how it can help us is really in sharing a language beyond the protest language and the actual demands, actually bring these demands into actual social and, and judiciary uh, legal changes. And I have a lot more to say, but I think I'll stop here. So. <laughs> and uh, so thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Lara. I have to say, just sort of seeing the, the images now on, and, on, that you presented and the images I still have in my, my head from the mass mobilization in Belarus, to say the visual language and the aesthetics seem to be more similar in the Belarus and Egyptian case. And I think there's something, something else in terms of also the visuals, the aesthetics going on in, in Poland. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, if it's something to do with that, it's, if it's in a way um, a, a more issue-based um, uh, protest in, in Poland and against the whole regime in, in, um, in Egypt and um, uh, Belarus. I don't know. I mean, it was, there was something more similar there, I think. But I wanted to ask you, Lara, because you really gave a great example of how there can be active bridges. No, Anna told us uh, we shouldn't think too clearly in these categories of what is digital and what's in this happening in the street. And you gave a very powerful example of a of a bridge in a way, sort of that one brings back also actively um, sort of um, online images to um, the, the the street uh, protesters. But I'm wondering about the 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 general idea of an archive of, of protests in authoritarian settings and what happens later on. So um, how do you archive and for whom do you archive this? I mean, again, of the cases I'm personally most familiar with the Belarusian case and where there were many images, it would be outright dangerous for most people to actually keep and distribute and, and allow access to these images that were produced um, uh, a lot in the early early period of the protests. So I, I wonder, there's also a lot of, I suppose, safety, ethical issues involved. Um, so for whom is the archive? How do you select? And it could also easily endanger people, the fact that everything is now available in, in images and you can sort of trace these um, or, or, or keep these digital traces. I was wondering if you could um, uh, sort of ex expand on that a bit and, and maybe Alexander and, and Anna have, have um, something to add on that too. Um, I mean, uh, I think I want to go back to one point which has to do with the archive, which is uh, resistance. So, of course, we are talking about resistance here and especially in, um, uh, you know, non-democratic societies and dictatorships, uh, even more so that word is significant. Um, I was interested in what happened, and I talked a lot about photography and digital photography as a kind of big shift in the, the, the world of images, because also because of the way that images came out of Tahrir, and I'm talking came out literally how they actually were done in Tahrir, taken in Tahrir, and then shared with the rest of the world. So um, if you remember, there was a few days where the internet was shut down. And uh, only a few people, because of their connection with activists across the world and their communities of activists already, they were able to um, uh, locate an actual company that was very small at the time and that was not shut down as the big ones. Uh, and so it was like a little hole in the net and you know, someone find the hole and they were able to, with the help of people outside of Egypt, bring out the material and export it and upload it to the internet. And so it was very interesting how um, this began uh, in Tahrir and the real core of the tents that were placed in the middle of the square. There was a media tent and that media tent was very uh, crazy because there was no organization. Of course, it was very quickly done and on the moment, on the spot, people came, downloaded their photos onto a computer or five computers in that tent and then as we went, they were, you know, uh, the images were uploaded to the internet. It was at the time a website called I am Tahrir, I am 25, Jan 25, something like that, which you can find, I think, online, but probably is deactivated. Um, so really from day one, the notion of archiving has to be understood as a very transformative and constantly redefined term where the 
collecting of material is in itself a way of resistance. And so um, how and for whom do we do archive? So it depends on the moment in the protest. So are we in the moment of the three days of the first uprising or are we five years down the road or even 20 years later when maybe all of this will be completely obsolete because we're in the dark age and digital material will probably not exist and at the rate we're going, we don't know if we we'll even have internet in five years across the world. So, um, so you know, there's uh, uh, the, 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 the question of how is, you know, I did what I could with my own means, you know, I actually what I showed you with the timeline with all the different pages that you can find on the internet with the, the wiki, wiki, um, wiki Saura, the wiki revolution page that I showed as an example is, um, is, a, is an actual introduction to what exists on the internet as possible uh, res for possible research on what happened during that time. Uh, but of course, what was interesting to me at the very beginning of collecting all this was to realize that I was only one of many collecting. And there is a lot of practice of collecting that were taking place. So individual practices, institutional practices, um, uh, independent media initiatives practices, activist practices, each different group created their own archive. And so each of us has their own way of thinking about the archive. My way of thinking about the archive is really to uh, constantly reinvent its meaning and to dig into it, pull things out, and then bring it back in and then pull different things out. And constantly as this is happening, it's being fed by new events taking place on a daily basis in the world. And so um, every single time that something comes out of the archive, the question of how and what's the, what's the language for whom this is addressed and who am I putting in danger is obviously on the table. Uh, it's a big, big question. We could almost do a whole conference on this. Um, but uh, since day one, it is when you're in that kind of world, you are in danger. Let's be clear. Uh, this is the condition sine qua non. You know, if you're not going to put yourself in danger, then you're not in quote a revolutionary. If you don't believe that you're giving yourself to the cause all the way, then you're not a revolutionary. But there are ways to do this in more or less intelligent ways and to avoid direct provocation and to find ways to use languages when, uh, uh, when things are completely shut down and ways to uh, uh, create dialogue and continue dialogue in spite of uh, the conditions that exist and that today are much worse than before 2011, by the way, in Egypt. And so um, the, I think these how and whom are constantly being evaluated and constantly being dealt with. And then the ethical and safety issues, of course, are part of this, of these questions too. And so, of course, exposing people uh, was there was a very good example during the revolution itself, where Sambo was this Egyptian man who I'm sure is still in prison um, because he was not someone famous or didn't have very uh, big connections in you know the high sphere of Egypt and so on, and was just a simple man participating in, participating in the in the uh, in the protest, and he picked. Um, a weapon by a gun or a weapon, I don't know what the term, proper term is, from at the front line from the police. And because someone photographed him, photographed him holding it, he was then two days later, as the protests were happening in the midst of the revolution, he was arrested for um, having a weapon without an authorization and for that image. So of course, the question of who do you expose when you take a photo of someone and put it on the internet is incredibly important. And who do you protect by doing that too? And so there's a kind of give and take issue here where of course with face, face recognition, the technologies of today, they can be co-opted by uh, protesters as well as by the state. So we are constantly using technology with pros and cons. And so it's cons what's really, really important is to again, and I will finish here, I spoke too much, is to know the technologies and understand what they do in both sides and who you put in danger or not, and also know your rights. And so this is really, really uh, the keys, I think, to...
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, you 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 rightly pointed out that uh, we focused on the protester side um, today, but and also how um, protesters might learn how how a momentum builds. Um, but clearly, um, authoritarian states also learn and use um, technology, and 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 we see that I think in all of the the cases as well. Um, I think in, in, in general, I think I find this idea of, of the archive and how one archives um, or even remembers uh, protests, which now include so many digital elements, if we stick to, to Anna's plea to really think of them as, as one joined up thing, um, then that, that raises a question once um, something gets repressed temporarily or permanently and we don't have maybe so many images in that moment available and this would be the situation right now in Belarus it sort of disappears faster perhaps from from a kind of international attention at least if possibly also intent attention in a particular country or a context regional context as well so then how to kind of preserve that might actually be a bigger challenge um, uh, so one can see how the momentum builds really fast and changes the language, the aesthetics, but also probably it, it can sort of drop down or drop away um, quite quickly as well. I wonder if, if Alexander or Anna, if you want to come in on this as well. And I should say, I, I see a first question or comment coming in. I'm going to read it. It's quite long and then tie it into the discussion. But please, anybody listening and viewing us, um, start writing some comments and questions in the chat. But first of all, Alexander or Anna, do you want to come in on this? Anna, do you want to make a start? Um, yeah, very quickly, because yeah, actually, I, I, I very like the idea of archive of a living being, sort of, um, for many reasons. And also, I like your Gwen remark on how important archiving is, archiving as a practice, I would say, uh, because, you know, uh, when I got interested in a Black protest. I, I got interested mostly uh, because of how hashtag Twitter hashtag can become a narrative device, so to speak. Because I've seen many micro narratives being shared under uh, Black protest hashtag that uh, announced um, the, the the first stage of the of the Polish protest in 2016. So uh, when I started uh, archiving it, um, you know, actually there is no way to archive um, a social media proprietary platform content in the finer granularity. I mean, you can do it if you're interested in um, the question, for example, how, how qu quickly the hashtag spreads, how popular it is, you know, but there is no way to archive the uh, singular tweets, for example, right, and their content for many reasons. So what we need is actually a practice of archiving that is being uh, embedded into protest itself, so to speak. Uh, so we need communities of practice around archiving. So uh, I know at least two archives in Poland that that, um, uh, that set to document um, uh, what was going on in October. One is, is a private uh, initiative of an artist and, and a scholar, Jennifer Rambe, Rambe. Another is an archive um, uh, initiated and, and stored uh, by the European Solidarity Center. Because you know, the problem with archives and archiving is that you need an infrastructure for this. You need the proper digital infrastructure. So, so that's the whole topic that we probably want going to touch upon um, today. So th that would be my remark on archiving. And when it comes to images, uh, I think that the fact that uh, the protests on Tahrir Square that Lara was talking about has happened almost 10 years ago. So there was absolutely different uh, technology back then. Uh, in, to, in 2020, in, in, in Poland in October, one of the significant type of images we've seen was the drone uh, capturing the, the mass movement on the streets. So we sort of saw ourselves, uh, you know, through the lens of the drone that is seeing us from the above. We're just tying up to this question about surveillance, uh, surveillance technology. So, but that. That may be um, later on, as uh, some, some other folks also uh, discuss. And the last thing I would like to say is actually a question to Lara. Lara, have you ever encountered a project by Egyptian American artists, uh, a dictionary of revolution? 
this beautiful project and I'm pasting it uh, in into a chat uh, because actually it is about Tahrir protest and Tahrir Square and it might be interesting to you as well although it is language based um she was also I think um, it's the circle no yeah the circle exactly yes yeah. yes I know it mm -hmm. so so that that's also a remark that we need artists because actually um this activity uh, like you presented is, uh, I think, one of the ways to make the pro uh, pro um, protest alive and, and working even after it, it, it's finished. So yeah, that, that would be my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Alexander, did you want to come in as well on the notion of the archive and, and what that could mean? Um, well, um, in fact, uh, regarding aesthetics and images in, uh, in case of in case of more difficult environments like Belarus, um, indeed it becomes more difficult to document and uh, and store things. And moreover, when state is not interested in preserving these documents, uh, it's only activists who can do this or people abroad. So people try to preserve things, but uh, without proper institutional support, uh, without uh, essentially any academic institutions that would be independent from the state of Belarus is very difficult to, to achieve. And indeed, um, for instance, there were also use of drones during the process of Belarus, but we know that the state of or state security developed uh, tools to intercept drones, to catch them. <laughs> so no one can uh, see the scale of the process sometimes. And the same comes for a general sort of presence of the images from, from this context. Uh, uh, we've seen gradually less and less content coming from Belarus, though protest continued. And one of the reasons, of course, people get tired a bit, maybe I've seen the same stories once and again. But other key reason was that essentially international journalists were prohibited from entering very often. It was very more increasingly difficult to come and to, uh, to, to, to film and to take pictures while it, local people being just prosecuted and the local journalists been arrested so that's that's one of the key reasons why visual has been very much restricted over time the pro protests progressed over months and several months over time they became much more di difficult to document but at the same time as we as rightly suggested it's really amazing to see similarities between egyptian aesthetics and belarusian one and perhaps one of the key reasons is similarities between the context so they indeed to dictatorships, to, to authoritarian regimes, and the uprisings, surprises that they experienced were anti-authoritarian uprisings, amazing huge mass mobilizations that had this kind of national uh, sort of level agenda that united all types of groups, uh, all types of uh, people. And not it's all, no other coincidence that um, uh, Arab Spring was named in fact after uh, spread of nations of 1848 so long ago but in fact i think uh, the sequence of events i mentioned at the beginning i think is relevant for our region that belarus is perhaps just another country of arab spring just the uh, events happen a bit later than they happened in uh, in, in other countries Thank you very much, Alexander. Let's pick up uh, a couple of questions and comments in the in the chat. Um, uh, one comment or question is about uh, digital control and surveillance mechanisms also getting stronger as a result of some of these um, dynamics, sort of the, the the counter movement, if you like. And you've all already uh, talked a bit about this. And the comment refers to both Tahrir but also to Turkey. And I think if I understand the correct question correctly about the possibilities of a struggle against this, um, this trend greater towards greater control, sort of, um, I mean, it's almost like a bit of a balance sheet. I mean, on the one hand, you have this type of mobilization, but then also the strengthening of um, uh, digital control or, or surveillance. Um, and the, the second point, and take your pick what you want to, it's, I think it's a related point, um, the question, so how would you evaluate, the question by Katarina, how would you evaluate the risks of the power of the post-digital protests being hijacked by different groups, fringe groups, elites who can mobilize or use the mobilization power in their interest? And the example of the US Capitol was um, given here, but, but we can think of other examples too. Who would like to sort of make a start? And I think they're they interrelated these two questions. 
not all at once. <laughs> Anna, yes. Yeah, I will start again because actually this, this the second question about nefarious groups uh, hijacking the, the, the digital digital process that is, that is something that actually troubles me, um, considering the fact that over the last I think two years uh, we've seen the the flight of far right groups to alternative social um, media apps, and you know Capitol Hill attack was directly related to this uh, service that is discontinued now uh, called. Um, forgot the name for it actually but um that was that was quite well known at at, at the time and um and uh widely um uh advertised even uh but there's a, a number of uh social media platforms that are not visible and not seen from from um uh that, that are under radar so to speak those far right venues which are actually the, the process is caused mostly by uh the pressure on uh the well-known and popular social media uh, platforms such as facebook and twitter and you know after twitter discontinued uh Donald Trump's activity there, uh, the, those uh, social the alternative social media platforms sort of you know uh, mushroomed and and got spread, and such as uh, for example MeWe or uh, or uh, I think AllTube. That's that's the service I've seen a, a couple of them actually. And, and this is, I mean, this is a troubling activity in many regards. And I would say that um, it also connects to much bigger issues such as disinformation, um, weaponizing, um, uh, information um, uh, weaponization, well, weaponization of uh, information. That would be probably um, uh, better. A uh, better phrase. Uh, so, so these are all big issues. But the problem is that um, uh, I'm not sure if we have any easy answer to um, evaluating the risks, uh, as because I would say that the whole informational environment is extremely unstable. For, for many reasons, including the fact that uh, major media outlets um, uh, actually. Uh, are also victims to their own strategies because if you um, 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 if you get back to a few years ago, uh, major media outlets um, were prone to uh, the process that we call clickbait now, right? So posting um, the type of information or the or the content that is highly clickable, which in in turn brought uh, this shift in the whole information environment, uh, where the, the the focus is on on highly emotional content, which brought uh, you know the the um, uh, quick rise of cons conspiracy theories and such. So I would say we we would need much uh, more sophisticated theoret theoretical tools to look into those processes, but I, I'm glad that um, uh, Katarina brought, uh, brought up this issue. Definitely, this is something that we should dedicate more attention to. Thank you. Laura, Alexandria, do you want to come in on this as well? Laura. Maybe I can just say a few words. I think, you know, I want to go back to uh, uh, maybe give a counter example. So yes, of course, the, the you know, the, uh, the tools are being hijacked uh, by the nefarious powers, but in the case of the capital and, and in general, they're being hijacked by the state. So, you know, it's, a, it's the same, the mechanisms don't change. It's just, it's just that we live in the 21st century. So the tools we're using today are social media, but, and so of course things go much faster because of the, the, uh, the possibility of social media spreading to uh, much faster and to bigger uh, groups. Um, but the dynamics remain the same as in any kind of battle and war, which is that, you know, who has the best technology, who has the best tool, and how do you use it in the best way to get to where you want. So everybody has an objective, um, nefarious or not. In the case of the capital, let's not forget that these groups were supported by uh, the actual social media platforms owners themselves and by uh, politicians. So 
there's that also behind. It's not just uh, operating independently. It's not just it's not just a machine. It's a machine that's uh, controlled by also uh, very big corporations and political, um, you know, uh, political groups. Um, and another example, I don't know if you remember, and I can't really uh, remember what was the exact context, but it made me think immediately of the uh, use of uh, social media also uh, by uh, groups to um, prevent Trump from being reelected when a very young group of uh, people, of a very big group of young people, uh, vote online. And I can't remember what was the platform, maybe K-pop. That was K-pop oh, well. fans. That was K-pop fans who uh, actually got organized. I think with with mostly with TikTok, which is also you know the yes, history the behind TikTok. TikTok being banned in the US. That's one of the theories. Exactly. And so TikTok therefore was used to uh, buy all the tickets uh, to avoid people actually joining the Trump rally in Texas. I think it was. And so that, uh, for me, was a fantastic example of how we are 10 years down the road. Yes, surveillance technology is much more uh, developed and used by the states than it, it was 10 years ago. Uh, however, our young people and our you know, new energy, new people, new uh, social platforms, there's constantly also a kind of push and pull situation and everybody's always there's always a hole in the system and that hole in the system is what we need to try and make bigger constantly and to multiply to like make more holes in the system which is decentralized technologies multiply the number of platforms uh, uh, bypass the system by using the system and that's always been the case that's historically the way things have always happened so i think things are doubly um, as much as they're worrying, there's also a lot of hope that there's always a lot of hope and there's always a lot of possibilities to respond to things. We're also much more educated, literate, aware, conscious, ready, and kind of collectively understanding that the work cannot be done alone and individually. And I think that's also a very important part of uh, how being on the ground and online are both incredibly important aspects of the, the possible success of protest and of protest becoming actual change in society. So yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Alexander, you had unmuted yourself as well. Do you want to come in on this? All right. Oh, okay, maybe very, quick, very quickly. I think in, in, in my experience, what happens when activists need to deal with surveillance, and surveillance is indeed one of the key challenges they face, is they actually learn quite fast to address it using technologies. So technology has been used to surveil, but activists learn to learn how to use technologies to unsurveil themselves, or to, in fact, how to hide deeper very often. And that's what happens then, uh, what helps them to reconfigure their protest uh, organizations. That's what gives the rise to new types of leadership within movements, anonymous leadership, invisible, but very powerful everyday coordinators that we've seen in Belarus, we've seen in Russia, we've seen in other countries, uh, in Hong Kong, recent anti-authoritarian uprisings. And in fact, most interestingly, similar technologies help to rise uh, uh, similar uh, anonymous leaders that av avoid surveillance in democratic states. In fact, uh, US, US movement been mentioned, it was very much sort of affected by these conspiracy theories of QAnon. And QAnon in itself uh, revolves around one or several anonymous personalities, right? Who try to hide their identity in order to avoid surveillance. So this is a phenomenon that is uh, is quite universal, seems like. But most interesting, I think, most interesting and actually most disturbing is that most dangerous type of surveillance, dangerous type of surveillance is not one that emerges online, that exists online. In fact, most dangerous type of surveillance 
now develops offline. This is this video surveillance, surveillance of our offline public spaces that been implemented uh, by the use of artificial intelligence through automatic face recognition. And this is most dangerous type of surveillance that's going to be implemented, first of all, across authoritarian regimes. China is the pioneer. Russia learns very fast from China. Belarus is the following. And that's where the poly, this, this training ground for this most dangerous, I think, type of surveillance where no one would be able to escape from the state, where this Aurelian reality, when it's not you who watch TV set, it's TV set watches you. You remember this television watches you rather than you watch them. That's where that's where it's gonna emerge and it emerges very rapidly. And I think that for that, I think there's no yet solution uh, proposed by any activist group, except for total sort of uh, escape, but it's very difficult. Thank you. Um, we're slowly or very fast, actually, unfortunately, running running out of time um, in this interesting discussion. But we want to include Kirill's question, um, and maybe I, I address you first, Anna, because it is phrased in quite conceptual terms. I think it 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 uh, goes back to some of the aspects you highlighted already. To which which extent can a post digital or a digital protest be defined through a specific temporality and? And maybe this also then will we'll go one last round and really think about how I think it connects to the beginning of the discussion, sort of how comparable uh, kind of protests are um, in their combination of digital and, and offline elements, or how specific they are, how maybe it's not only time specific, but also place specific. Maybe you can sort of offer a few final reflections in a round and maybe if we start with you, Anna. Uh, that's that's a very interesting question, actually, and uh, there's a number of ways to answer it, including the very particular temporalities embedded in the digital technologies, right? In how computers uh, work with uh, with time and time sequences, and actually time as an operator. Here, I would hint at uh, the work by. Uh, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Ernst uh, mostly, uh, and his take on on archiving. But I will I will leave this aside, and uh, I think I would um, uh, emphasize how our notion of temporality has changed uh, with the dig digital technologies, where we have more access to um, to the cultural memory, so to speak, and um, and that actually. Uh, that the, the, the timelines are getting more um, entangled, so to speak. Uh, our past and present uh, is very often confined. Um, or uh, we have the impression of um, moving um, in circles, so to speak. And um, this leads me to uh, the question about com comparability of the protest. So, uh, here, um, Gwen, you came up with this remark that um, the protests in Belarus and Egypt share cert certain uh, features, um, and the protest I was talking about is, is different. And indeed, it is different in terms that um, uh, the protest in Poland um, evolves around a specific issue, which is um, which is. Um, women's reproductive rights, but it, it is happening, it has been happening um, within the framework of a Polish democracy um, um, getting fast, I mean, fast deteriorating over the course of the last two years. And although, of course, uh, Polish activists are re relatively um, um, safer than their counterparts in Belarus or Egypt or um, 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 uh, Palestine or anywhere else in the world where we, uh, where we see uh, the full-blown authoritarian regimes, and um, nevertheless, in Poland, we also have, um, in, uh, I would say, rise in authoritarian techniques being employed and deployed uh, in, in the, on the streets. So because this, this protest, this feminist protest um, in Poland involved many young people, so of course, 
police uh, came up with this brilliant uh, strategy of actually scaring out the very young people. So uh, they didn't um, harass uh, the adults. They harassed uh, the you know teenagers in the small towns because they knew that they would be the easy target, right? So, um, so and we have this this uh, impression of getting back in time currently. Of course, um, of course, that, that would be um, maybe simplistic to, to say that we're getting fast, uh, getting back to the 80s, but there is the widespread uh, popular opinion that the current um, uh, strategies, governmental strategies are very much uh, alike with what we uh, known, what we've known, what, what was uh, actually experienced um, uh, before 1989. And uh, but I, I'm not I'm not absolutely implying that we're somehow farther or somewhere else than Belarus or Egypt. Far from it. I would say that uh, increasingly we see those timelines getting messed up to the extent that actually I would say that uh, we in Poland have a lot to learn both from. Belarusian activists and Egyptian uh, activists when it comes, for example, to archiving, to coming up with effective strategies of counteracting um, uh, the, the, the police control and governmental control, etc. So when it comes to protests, I think um, it is um, really important that uh, to, to, to remember that, that actually the, the specific temporality is the temporality of a protest itself. So um, I would say that, um, that well, it means that we, we uh, should and we can, and, and, uh, and uh, it will be high, highly advisable to learn from each other. That's how I think we progress. So. So that would be my answer. But of course, I, I, I'm tempted to ask um, Kirill uh, what he actually, what does he mean uh, by his question? What, what kind of specific temporality has he in mind? So that would be also my, my question. Maybe he'll write it in the chat and explain a bit what he, what he exactly meant. But uh, uh, Alexander, your last kind of reflecting maybe remarks reflecting upon sort of the temporality, maybe specific or not so specific nature of, um, of protests. And then last but not least, we'll turn to Lara. Yeah, I don't really work much with that uh, concept uh, of time though. Uh, I think uh, I already mentioned in my, in, in my introduction that um, apparently some time, uh, Sometimes this timeline of events uh, looked broadly and in larger context sometimes helps to understand and learn through future trajectories of movements, right? So, and this uh, specific, um, I think um, our region gives some, give us some hope for uh, food and better changes and uh, uh, in that respect, well, Belarus remains an anomaly and very unusual temporal anomaly, in fact, uh, across, across Europe. But again, as I mentioned, timeline suggests that there, there should be some uh, good positive changes in the future. Okay. And uh, Laura, obviously, temporality is at the, at the heart of the notion of an archive. So give us your um, sort of brief um, reflection on this. Yeah, I'm trying to be brief. I'm not very good at not being brief. Um, Anna, I just want to say that uh, uh, in a way, Anna already uh, answered the, that part of the question is that um, I mean, the very reason for me to archive is also to understand the language of protest. And, and so in a way, it's not about the protest itself. It's about the core need that connect all of us universally which is the quest for freedom and how it's expressed in different cultures using uh, similar iconographies sometimes because of our shared uh, culture through the internet, but also our mechanism of responding, resisting, uh, reacting, which are universal. And so for me, Tahrir was really uh, because of its place in the history of the last 10 years and how it kind of you know, following Tunisia, 
and how it became kind of uh, inspired by Tunisia, how it by its scale helped the, what started in Tunisia to really take a much more global ampler and, and influence. And so if we remember, then we followed, uh, what followed was Occupy movements and then the rest is history. And so um, to go back to temporality, um, I would like to propose that we kind of uh, become little birds and go out in the sky and really look at the earth from a much higher point of view and think about temporality as the history of the world and where we stand uh, today. Because I think we're talking also what's really always very important to remind ourselves is that when we have this conversation is that we do not have the same tools in different places at different moments. We do not come from the same places, from the same parts of the world. We are not facing the same situations at the same level of the situation. Some of us are at the beginning of a, of a moment and a cycle, which uh, uh, I really analyze through the Tahrir archives, these different cycle of revolting. So they don't really, it's not really about Egypt as much as it is about the cycle of rebellion and how they start and how they, there's anchored moment that actually exists. If you look at every revolution, it will be more or less the same. And so what's really interesting is this notion of temporality is to go to, let's not go too far in time, but let's go in the 20th century when there's no internet, we are protesting in the streets, we have different ways of protesting, and then we are using social media, digital, uh, digital tools, citizen journalism is born in the 90s, and then we have social media, we're in the 21st century, and in some places, we're already seeing a total collapse of states, and I'm coming from one, so this is why I really want to talk about it before we end, I'm coming from Beirut last night, and so we're watching as we speak on a daily basis, a complete fallout of the corruption of a regime, the corrupt regime falling apart, the country falling apart because of the most incredible uh, uh, state of corruption that we've uh, experienced and that we're watching on a daily basis uh, in the last 10 years, uh, possibly in history. I don't think there's another example. Even Venezuela doesn't come close to what Lebanon is going through right now. And so what does that mean in the, in the context of our conversation is that we start in the street, we go digital, we go social media, we go continuum to use the word of Anna, which is this kind of parallel between what happens on the street and what happens on the internet and how we bring the two together. But in some cases, we go back to the street. And what does it mean go back to the street? It doesn't mean protest like we did 10 years ago. It means planting trees. It means making your own bread. It means gathering communities to reinvent and reform the legal state of things in our villages, cities, and, and, and uh, countries like Chile in 2019. And the very interesting uh, way that communities got together in their neighborhoods with chairs and sofas and discussed how to change uh, their reality. Uh, and Lebanon, where most of my friends who are activists and green activists have replanted the entire city with trees and are trying to give some kind of long to the city that it's lost. And so I think we have to consider what we live in and that the real fight is also climate crisis and that all these things are going to have a huge effect on how we continue to protest in this post-digital era and maybe temporality to go back to that question. So thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, you 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 tied in also what Alexander and Anna also talked about, sort of the uh, new forms of, and, and I think in Belarus, that's exactly what we're seeing more of at the moment, sort of that it's only possible in, in neighborhoods to to get to do get together, do things. So it's not, it's a maybe the next stage in, in a certain cycle that you all um, sort of talked about that it also transforms um, how we how we think or should think about um, activism. We could go on for a long time, I think, and I hope we have another opportunity. Um, I've, I've learned a lot from you and thank you very much. I think it was a really good dialogue also between your various uh, perspectives. 
So let me thank you, Anna, Lara, and Alexander. And uh, as always with these formats, it's, it'll end very abruptly, but um, thank you very much. And I hope we, we get the chance to continue this discussion. And those who joined us from the Via Drinicum, I'm sure you will um, be able to pick up on some of these themes. And I'm sure also all three presenters would also be up for, for more discussion or, or email contact. So thank you very much and uh, hope to continue the discussion at some point. Thank, thank you, definitely. I would love to answer, to reply to Kirill's, um, uh, you know, reformulation of his question because it's a very clever one. So I hope we will have some chance in the future to do so. Absolutely. Um, Get in touch with him directly. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Bye. -bye.